police, so much so that the Los Angeles cops who beat Rodney King, these are some stills from that, that famous uh, video, uh, they initially tried to justify their assault by saying they thought he was under the influence of PCP. One of them described King as a, quote, monster, end quote, with, quote, Hulk-like strength. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we were talking about. That, that all. So was there any truth to these PCP horror stories? Well, in 1988, uh, several researchers reviewed all of the relevant journal articles that had been published up until that point on, on PCP and humans. Uh, a psychiatrist named Martin Greger. Uh, he and his colleagues found scant evidence for the assumption that PCP provokes violent behavior in humans with predictable regularity, which is sort of the, the impression you got from all the press coverage. High doses of PCP, they noted, can produce severe agitation and hyperactivity, coupled with cognitive disorganization, disorientation, hallucinations, and paranoia. Combined with the drug's anesthetic effect, which makes users less sensitive to pain, and therefore harder to restrain, such acute reactions have contributed to PCP's reputation for transforming people into incredible hulks. Yet in their search of the literature, Brecker and his co-authors found only three documented cases in which people under the influence of PCP alone had committed acts of violence. They also noted that between 1959 and 1965, when they were experimenting with PCP as a possible human anesthetic, it was given to hundreds of patients, but not a single case of violence was reported. They concluded that PCP does not live up to its reputation as a violence inducing drug. Science fiction fans were not the only ones who recognized the theme underlying the PCP stories. It was also familiar to drug policy historians. They knew that before marijuana acquired a reputation for making people uh, docile and listless, uh, it was feared as a killer drug that triggered mayhem and murder. A 1917 report from the U.S. Department of Agriculture quoted the police captain who said marijuana users become very violent. This is probably, listen to this and maybe you'll you see your own experience with marijuana use reflected. Uh, see this, it just rings through the Marijuana users become very violent, especially when they become angry and will attack an officer even if a gun is drawn. They seem to have no fear, are insensible to pain, and display abnormal strength, so that it will take several men to handle one man. Uh, under Harry Hanslinger, who was the founding director of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, uh, the FBN got a lot of mileage out of claims like this. A 1936 pamphlet from the Bureau warned that prolonged use of marijuana frequently developed a delirious rage, which sometimes leads to high crimes, uh, such as assault and murder. Hence, marijuana has been called the killer drug. Marijuana sometimes gives man the lust to kill, unreasonably and without motive. In many cases of assault, rape, robbery, and murder are traced to the use of marijuana. Now, you might think this precedent would have made government officials cautious about promoting claims that PCP causes violence. To the contrary, United Director Robert DuPont announced that everything people used to say about marijuana is true of angel dust. A more recent example of uh, a drug that supposedly causes violence uh, is bath salts, which is actually a blanket term for uh, these, uh, these products that are sold ostensibly not for human consumption. And that, that's the way in which they are quasi-legal. If the drug itself has not been explicitly banned, or some of them have been, you can sell them as long as it's allegedly with bath salts or some other uh, purpose that doesn't involve human consumption uh, with, without getting arrested. Uh, but they all contain some kind of synthetic stimulant that is supposed to be a substitute for amphetamines or cocaine. Not everybody finds it to be uh, an adequate substitute. Uh, but that's, that's basically what you're dealing with. Um, and this was a, a, something that broke on the scene just in the past few years. There were a lot of stories about bath salts. Um, but it, is, it was especially intense uh, last summer. Uh, for about a month, there were major news outlets all around the world that accepted and propagated the idea that bath salts were responsible for a grisly attack in which one man chewed off most of another man's face on Miami's MacArthur Causeway. And this story gave us some, some classic headlines for example, uh, that's not just one more. Uh, this one is from uh, CBS uh, News, uh, which was, uh, it was, it was the CBS affiliate in Miami that actually got this whole story rolling. Uh, 
by, by basically promoting the uh, unsubstantiated claims from a local police union official. That's where all this came from. Um, so the, this, is the, this is the national CBS headline was, bath salts, drug alleged face chewer Rudy Eugene may have been on, plague police and doctors. So he's either playing it safe there, but he may have been on it, we're not sure, but they definitely, definitely play the police and doctor, you know that much. This, my, probably my favorite one though, was new bath salts zombie drug makes Americans eat each other. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's not much equivocation there, and what I love about this is this was from RT, and it used to be Russia Today, but uh, not necessarily about the initials. Can you see what their slogan is? Question more. <laughs> Not so much when, when it's dealing with the when they're dealing with bath salts. Um, so light marijuana and PCP bath salts reportedly caused that reportedly, reportedly rendered people uncontrollable, giving them the strength of several men. Remember that was the thing we saw with both of these other drugs. They could become uh, so strong and so uncontrollable that you need a whole bunch of people uh, to subdue them, right? Uh, but there was a dispute as to exactly how many men you needed to control somebody with <laughs> a bath salt. Is that Yeah, well, this, this, I mean, this guy, Rudy Eugene, who was called the uh, Miami, the Causeway Cannibal, Miami Zombie, possibly the Caus Causeway Zombie, the okay, Miami Cannibal, and and various combinations of those terms. Um, but in the midst of all this, this coverage of this, this, uh, this Causeway Cannibal story, uh, Armando, Aguilar, who was, this is the head of the local uh, police union, the guy who started this whole story basically by just hardly speculating to the press. He claimed, I took care of a 150 pound individual who you would have thought he was 250 pounds. It took six security officers to restrain him. Now six seemed to be a pretty strong contender because two days later, the very same TV station, this is the local CBS affiliate in, uh, in Miami, they attributed exactly the same quote uh, to a local emergency room physician named Paul Adams. But that wasn't the end of the matter because that the next day, Adams, the same emergency room physician, told ABC News it usually takes four to five people to call someone who appears in the emergency room after consuming bath salts. That same day, however, the Daily Beast quoted Adams as saying, to place someone safely in restraints, it's taken seven security guards and one doctor. <laughs> now we're up to eight. The same story also quoted uh, a police sergeant who was the vice president of the local police union, who said, we just had a guy that took seven police officers and two supervisors <laughs> to restrain. That's nine. So if you average all of these numbers, we can scientifically determine that it takes 6.4 men to restrain the typical bath salt fortified per, per patient. Uh, Charlie Dent, who's a Republican congressman from Pennsylvania, jumped on this Miami zombie story, uh, rather like Rudy Eugene did on his poor victim, Ronald Papo. <laughs> When they learn about this face, excuse me, when they learn, when they learn about this face chewing situation in Florida, that told roll call in early June, hopefully that will change a few minds. He was referring to the debate over this ability to introduce, uh, to ban some of the stimulants used in bath salts. Uh, and apparently, he got his wish because a few weeks later, uh, Congress approved the Synthetic Drug Abuse Prevention Act of 2012 advanced two of those stimulants, MDPV and Fedrone. On the very same day, toxicological tests revealed that Eugene had not consumed bath salts after all. I perhaps should add, though, he had consumed marijuana. So you know, maybe there was something to all that. So one obvious question raised by all of these horror stories about the terrible things that drug do the people is why do people continue taking these things if they're, they're so bad for them? Um, here's where addiction enters the picture. Um, is the idea that a drug can compel people to continue taking it. Uh, is one of the most important tenets of voodoo pharmacology because it makes possible all of these other terrible effects. Because otherwise, people would maybe try it once, and once they saw how terrible it was, they would just stop using it, right? Um, this is uh, actually, again, this is about alcohol. This is a courier in Ives prank called the Drunkards of Progress. And it illustrates the process by which a single drink with a friend, that's at the lowest level down here, uh, inexorably leads to higher levels of consumption. This is the idea of, of how uh, you know, drinking led to alcoholism, uh, culminating in poverty, disease, social isolation, desperation, crime, and suicide, blowing his brains out on the 
last step there at the bridge. Um, so the sociologist Harry Levine, who's at uh, Queens College, pointed out uh, several decades ago that the idea that drugs are inherently addicting was first systematically worked out for alcohol and then extended to other substances. Long before opium was popularly accepted as addicting, alcohol was so regarded. This template was applied to opiates in the early 20th century. As the psychologist Dan Peel notes, heroin came to be seen in American society as the non parallel drug of addiction, as leading inescapably from even the most casual contact to an intractable dependence, withdrawal from which was traumatic and unthinkable for the addict. In his 1996 History of Opium, the journalist Martin Booth sums up the popular wisdom about opiate dependence and addiction in general. Addiction is the compulsive taking of drugs which have, have such a hold over the addict he or she cannot stop using them without suffering severe symptoms and even death, he writes. Opiate dependence is as fundamental to an addict's existence as food and water, a physiochemical fact. An addict's body is chemically reliant upon its drug, for opiates actually alter the body's chemistry, so it cannot function properly without being periodically primed. A hunger for the drug forms when the quantity in the bloodstream falls below a certain level fail to feed the body, and it deteriorates, and may, drop, may die from drug starvation. So in Booth's uh, gloss, as in other popular portrayals, the potentially fatal agony of withdrawal is the gun that heroin holds to the user's head. And a couple of the popular examples of the similar portrayals, but not as well. So, uh, these accounts act greatly exaggerate both the severity and the importance of withdrawal symptoms. Um, <coughs> see how we are for time, so we'll have some time for questions. Uh, now, uh, when people suddenly stop taking heroin, they commonly report flu-like symptoms. So that might, might include um, especially gastrointestinal distress because, because opiates definitely do have an effect on bowel movements, on your whole gastrointestinal system, so it's not surprising you suddenly stop taking it. So people often experience uh, nausea, diarrhea, headaches, stomach cramps, muscular aches, runny nose and eyes, that kind of thing. So it's, it's not pleasant, but it's not life-threatening, unlike withdrawal from, from some drugs like, like alcohol or, or barbiturates. Uh, in fact, addicts who, who develop tolerance, right, so now they need a higher dose, higher, more expensive dose, to get the same effect, uh, often will voluntarily undergo withdrawal so they can begin using heroin again at a, at a lower level, uh, thereby reducing the cost of the habit. Uh, another sign that the fear of withdrawal symptom is not the essence of addiction is the fact that heroin users commonly drift into and out of the habit. So they might go through periods of abstinence and return to the drug long after any physical discomfort has faded away. More evidence uh, that withdrawal has been overemphasized as motivation for using opiates comes from patients who take narcotic painkillers for extended periods of time, like heroin addicts, they do develop so-called physical dependence, right? So what Booth was talking about, it does, does change your body to some extent. And they will experience withdrawal symptoms if they abruptly stop taking the drugs. Typically, doctors will taper you off if you've been on, on narcotic painkillers for, for a long period of time. But studies during the last few decades have consistently found that people who, even though they're taking these drugs, even though they develop, they develop so-called physical dependence, uh, they very rarely go on to use these drugs for non-medical purposes or psychological purposes. Or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so this is not actually a very controversial view among uh, people who study addiction or among psychiatrists, mental health professionals in general. Um, they long ago abandoned this idea that you need to have uh, physical dependence or, or tolerance. Um, in order to have addiction. So, so there are drugs that don't produce significant withdrawal symptoms, such as nicotine, cocaine, amphetamines. They're still considered addictive. Uh, it wasn't always the case. Uh, the Surgeon General, when he first started writing about smoking, said uh, something like, uh, smoking is habit form or habituating, but not addictive. And so basically what the American Psychiatric Association says now is that's really a mistake without a difference. All, all these drugs can be abused, they can lead to uh, a pattern of behavior uh, that is hard to break and leads to negative consequences. Um, this is just another example of how, how uh, uh, scientists have concluded that they really have oversold uh, the power of heroin and other opiates, so much so that, that the doctors and patients became uh, terrified of using them, even where it was appropriate for pain relief. Uh, this is the, the, head of, the former head of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, 
1989, said, we have been so effective in warning the medical establishment and the public in general about the inappropriate use of opiates that we have endowed these drugs with a mysterious power to, ens to enslave that is overrated. All right, so, so even if uh, addiction is not a physical, physical compulsion, maybe it, it, uh, certain drug experiences are so alluring that people find it impossible to resist them. Um, and so that, that's, uh, uh, oh, there's, there's another book. Here, here's a Agent for Heroin, which is an example of one of these sort of sensational, uh, uh, ostensibly anti-drug books uh, that also at the same time makes drug use seem sort of sexy and mysterious and appealing. Another, another book uh, from 1972 is called It's So Good, Don't Even Try It Once. The idea being that it's just, you won't be able to, you know, it's like a lazy pitch. You can't, so once you've had one, you can't possibly stop. Um, and Martin Booth, who's a reliable purveyor of this uh, sort of old-fashioned view of opiate addiction, tells us everyone is a potential addict. Addiction can start with the very first dose, and with continued use, addiction is a certainty. And that's, you know, any fun way you interpret that, it could just be sort of tautological, because if you continue to use it, you use it every day, and you just continue using it, then you're addicted. Um, but I don't think that's what he means. He means that if you use, dare to use it even a few times, you're going to be Yet the data on heroin use indicate that the drug is neither irresistible nor inescapable. To begin with, heroin is not a very popular drug. Uh, if you compare it to marijuana based on past year use, these are data from uh, federal drug use surveys. Drug use surveys that are sponsored by the federal government. They have certain problems, uh, which I can get into later in the q and if you're interested. Uh, but these are, these are the best data we have. And by, <coughs> by self-reported past year use, marijuana is more than 60 times as popular as heroin. Of the uh, 4.2 million or so Americans who have used heroin, uh, these are data from 2011, about 15% have used it in the last year, and 7% have used it in the last month. So in other words, the vast majority of these people either never became regular users or heavy users, or if they did, they tapered, tapered off. This is a very, very interesting study from way back in 1974. They looked at uh, Vietnam veterans who had been addicted to heroin, which is very common. Vietnam uh, for reasons that maybe are obvious. I don't think it's it was very rarely available. It was a very stressful situation, uh, alternating between you know, terror and boredom, both of which uh, heroin might help relieve. So it's not surprising uh, that a lot of soldiers <coughs> uh, used heroin in Vietnam. That was perceived as a huge problem by the Nixon administration. Um, and 